Uh, good morning. This is Miss Kopchik. Um, some of you, I'm your teacher. Others, I'm uh, Miss Kopchik, and you're in Miss Brown's class. But we're a team, and so I'm doing the lecture videos for the hydrology unit. Um, I'm going to be posting several lecture videos with questions. So please make sure that you are following along with your document so you can take appropriate notes. Hydrology is a huge unit. It is an extremely important unit because it talks about all of our water uh, issues and how we need to prevent water pollution and start conserving water more. So there's some background information, obviously, that we have to go through. And then we're going to be doing some labs throughout the unit as well. So I'm going to go ahead now and share my PowerPoint with you. And you can always pause it and go at your own pace to jot down your notes. And if you have any questions on any of this material, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, I am always available. And again, welcome Ms. Brown students. All right, so hydrology. This is obviously, hopefully you know a little bit about the water cycle, right? It is the scientific study of the movement, distribution, and management of water on the earth. So you do need to understand some terms, um, which you've probably been reintroduced to this year. But just in case, let's go through a little bit of these terms. Evaporation versus transpiration. Evaporation is when you take liquid water and you turn it into a gas, water vapor. Transpiration comes from vegetation, leaves, um, that type of thing where you're taking that water from that um, plant and it is evaporating uh, and turning into a gas. But we don't call that evaporation, we call it transpiration. So there is a slight difference between evaporation coming from a water source and transpiration coming from a vegetation source. And of course, once these things go up and travel into the atmosphere, they cool and condense and form liquid again and then it precipitates and once that water precipitates you can either have surface runoff or groundwater so we're going to be talking about why some water turns into surface runoff and why some then turns to groundwater and then eventually everything always leads down to the lowest point uh, which is sea level so let's take a little quiz here. Of all the water on the earth, how much is in the oceans? Does anybody know? It is 96.5%, all right? Out of all of our water, that is how much is in the oceans. That is unusable to us because it is salty. So how much of the world's water is frozen then and also unsuitable and unusable? That is 2.5%. So now what's left over? OK, what do we have left over for us as far as using agriculture, watering our crops, giving water to our animals, drinking, bathing, industrial use, manufacturing? Very little. OK, we take 100 percent. We subtract 96.5, which is the salty water. We subtract 2.5%, which is the frozen water, and we are only left with 1% of our entire water supply that is available to us in a usable form. That's huge because it's such a small percentage, right? Only 1%. Sometimes you might see it like this, and those are just some other ways uh, that make it a little bit easier, 97% salt water, 2% fr frozen, 1% uh, fresh water available. <clears throat> I, however, like to be a little bit more detailed in my numbers. And so I also like this table here. I love this bar graph because it breaks down exactly what you need to know as far as how much is in the oceans, how much is fresh water? Out of that 2.5% fresh water, 68.7% is locked away. Again, unusable in glaciers and ice caps. It is frozen. We can't use it. 
And then we have groundwater and surface water. This is what we have available for us to use. So if we break that down a little bit further for surface runoff or surface water, we're looking at lakes. That's the most. Atmosphere, if you remember, atmosphere varies between, you know, one to four percent, depending on if you're near water or not. Living things also house water, rivers, swamps, and marshes, and right here, soil moisture. This is going to be important because when we talk about soils and we talk about crops and agriculture, our soil, and if it's productive soil, which we want, has to contain a certain amount of moisture. All right, so a lot of our water, if you look at that, that's pretty high, 3.8% of that water that's usable to us is in soil, which is good. We want that there. But again, this is a very small amount compared to how much is frozen and then how much is salty. And that is important because we need to take water conservation seriously and do a good job um, with conserving the fresh water that we have. Here's just one other visual breakdown. I know I'm beating you to death with this, but it's important, okay? We have to understand that out of all the water on Earth, most of it, 99% is unusable. Whether or not it's salty or frozen, we are only able to use 1% of that fresh water, all right? Very important number. So how do we use that fresh water? This is something we're going to probably talk about later in more detail, but just to get an idea of where our global use of fresh water is, in the entire world, 70% of it goes to agriculture. We have to grow our food, we have to use uh, water to water our crops and to water our animals, so most of it by far goes towards agricultural purposes. And then we have an industrial use and manufacturing use for water and then domestic use. Um, domestic use is where you're probably thinking that you use the most water because you are drinking it, you're bathing it, you're washing clothes, you're washing your car. Those are domestic uses of fresh water. And then if you're in a developing country, which are low and middle class countries, a lot of it, again, is used for agricultural, um, less so for industrial because it's a developing nation, so they don't really have a lot of that industry um, and electrical power use. And then 8% again for domestic. Here is where our United States would fit in. We are a developed country. We are a high income country. So 59% of it is used for the industrial sector and that's manufacturing, that's power, electricity. Um, and when we get into our energy resources, we'll really get into how water is used here. And then agriculture is about 30%. And I want to take note about this domestic use, 11%, a little bit higher than everybody else because we're not good at, at conserving water. We might think we are, we might turn off the tap when we brush our teeth, but there's so many other ways that we can conserve our water. So we really do need to bring this domestic use down um, to mimic what other countries are using. So surface runoff versus groundwater. Why do we have some water running through the surface? And then why do we have some going into the ground? Storm water runoff. Okay, the water from rain or melting snow that runs off across the land instead of seeping into the ground. There is one reason why this happens, and it's because the soil or the ground or the um, surface is impermeable, meaning that water will not pass through that soil and so it has to run off to where it can find a local tributary or stream or creek. And there are a lot of issues with this and um, we'll be going through that today. But you have to understand 
that really surface runoff runs off because of impermeable surfaces. So let's look at Monroe for a minute, okay? How many inches of precipitation does Monroe get in any year? Anybody? 48 inches per year, all right? Out of that 48 inches per year, if you are in a rural type of area in Monroe, you only get 10% runoff. That's great because that means that 90% then will seep into the ground and percolate through the grasses and into the soil and down into the rock layers and get stored down there as groundwater. And that's really where we want to see uh, water stored. If you are in a more urban area in Monroe, or if you are in an area that is extremely urbanized like Charlotte, you are going to see lots of houses, lots of roads, lots of pavement, buildings, malls, parking lot. All of that is impermeable surfaces. And so it goes on to have 55% runoff. That means that there is less water than soaking into the ground as groundwater again, where we want to see that water go. So let's look at this relationship between permeable and impermeable surfaces. You have a nice rural area with natural ground cover, lots of trees, lots of vegetation. That is going to allow for just 10% runoff and everything else going back into the ground or evapotranspiration going back up and adding to the wonderful water cycle that allows us to have rain. And if you have a lot of evapotranspiration, then you won't have a drought because you have enough water vapor in the atmosphere to precipitate and then you have a nice hydrologic cycle going on. All right, then you go over here to your impervious cover, which is your impermeable surface, and that's your urban area. This is where you have, again, lots of concrete that is impermeable. And what this does is it decreases the amount of evapotranspiration here. So you have less water precipitating overall. You have a lot more surface runoff and you have less of that infiltration um, into your groundwater, okay? So all of this is gonna come into play and be connected over the next few weeks, but this is just your basic background here. So again, we want to see water that goes into the ground for several different reasons. And we're gonna talk a lot about this with our next lecture on groundwater. But as water percolates through and permeates through the soil, it actually becomes filtered, pollutants get removed, so it becomes cleaner, and then it is able to be stored deep in the ground for when we need it later. Runoff, though, picks up a lot of our pollutants, all right? I mean, let's be honest. You're going to see some images that are quite disturbing in this, in this PowerPoint, okay? Because we pollute. We litter. We do lots of horrible things to our environment, and all of that gets picked up and goes into our freshwater supply. All right, and that's part of the problem with that very limited 1% is because a lot of it becomes so polluted that it's very hard to clean and use. So we're gonna be looking now at how this stuff runs off, why it runs off and picking up those pollutants. So first, what is a watershed? A watershed is the area of land that drains stormwater runoff to a certain body of water. So this is a small area, all right? So you're gonna have a lot of smaller areas inside what we call a river basin. And so the small watershed is where you would have, you know, here's a 
creek or river and then you've got some little tributaries off to the side and all of this is going to go flow somewhere okay so that's the the area of land that drains stormwater runoff to a certain body of water so if you live in a watershed that is very urban versus rural you're probably going to have much more polluted water in that urban area so let's look at our lakes. Hopefully you guys know our lakes, but there's Lake Twitty, there's Lake Lee, and then there's Lake Monroe. These are our city of Monroe lakes. This lake right here is Lake Twitty. And hopefully if you live in Monroe especially, you know why this lake is important. If not, you must absolutely know why Lake Twitty is important. And it is because, important because this is where our water supply for the city of Monroe comes from. This is where our <clears throat> water treatment plant is. You cannot swim in here. You cannot fish in here. You cannot put a boat in here. This is our water. This is where we get our water. So if you turn on the tap, and you don't have a well somewhere in Monroe, like at Cata, when you turn on this, the faucets at Cata, your water, our water is coming from this lake. So we wanna try to keep this lake as clean as possible because the cleaner it is, the less chemicals we have to put in it through our water treatment plant. These are some watersheds here in Monroe. Okay, so we've got the Lake Twitty, we've got Richardson Creek, Lake Lee, Bearskin Creek, um, 12 Mile Creek. So depending on where you live, and you might wanna take a minute on that and find out where your watershed is. So again, those are smaller areas, but the river basins that are in North Carolina, they're a lot larger. And there are 17 river basins in North Carolina. And if you know, we are right about here in Union County. And our river basins, we're actually lucky, we are kind of have two. We have the Yatkin PD River Basin and the Catawba River Basin. So depending on what line you um, live by or on. If you live in Indian Trail, you might be in the Yatkin PD. If you live in Matthews, you might be in the Catawba. Um, specifically, Cata is in the Yatkin PD River Basin. So if you live next door to Cata, this is our river basin, the Yadkin PD. So when you look at your river basins, of course, these are much larger areas. Um, so our Yatkin PD and Catawba uh, River Basins are quite large and they extend all the way down and they will travel and the rivers will travel all the way down to the ocean because again, you know that your um, rivers always go uh, to the lowest point, which is at sea level. So our watersheds, no matter where we are around here, all of our water eventually ends up here um, by Georgetown, South Carolina, and it dumps out there. So again, name the two river basins in Union County. That is the PD River Basin and the Catawba River Basin. So storm water. Storm water is very important because this is where we see a lot of our runoff and that again picks up lots of pollutants and then it ends up in our drinking water supply in our oceans. So instead of going and seeping down nicely into the ground where we want to store it, it just runs off and pretty much becomes useless either because it's polluted or it goes back into the ocean. I know it's a little silly, but you have to understand only rain should go down the storm drain because if other things are going down the storm drain, the storm drain is dumping out into our drinking water supply. And so if you have a lot of toxins and plastics 
and organic debris and things we don't want going down the storm drain, that all ends up in our drinking water and then we have to treat it and then we're exposed to more chemicals. So stormwater pollution, let's look at that real quick because I have a little video of this too. This is what happens when there are there's pollution in your stormwater water. And this happens when you have flooding and a lot of rain. All of that is going to go into the storm drain. And I want you to think some of these cars might be putting out oil. All right. Some of these drivers might be throwing out their cigarette butts, their McDonald's wrappers. All of that stuff is in here floating down and going to end up in our drinking water supply. So this would be an outlet to some sort of creek. Does that look clean? Does that look like what we want to be putting in our drinking water? No, it's polluted. We are going to be talking throughout the rest of this about 10 common stormwater pollutants, and you will need to know some of these. And so as we go through, you're going to jot them down. So one of the most common things that we see are organic type of debris, leaves, that kind of now, This kind of stuff will get on top of our storm grates and clog them to create more flooding and you know turn around don't drown your car is not a boat okay everybody sing it because we all want to um this stuff when it clogs the storm drains then the storm water can't get to where it needs to go in our drinking water supply and it becomes a flooding hazard this is just one example of a storm drain um they are all over Monroe and they come into um, our lakes and tributaries and or streams and tributaries, excuse me. So all sorts of our creeks around Monroe have pollution. All right. Maybe you guys know Bearskin Creek. That's right there at Belt Tonawanda Park. Um, Richardson Creek is out by 601. Uh, then there's Stewart's Creek 74 and then some tributaries to Richardson's Creek. One of the things that we have to understand about pollution is something called a bioindicator. A bioindicator is a living organism that gives us an idea of the health of an ecosystem and so we can monitor what types of animals and insects live in water and then they will tell us hey if we have a lot of this the water's great and clean if we have a lot of this maybe we shouldn't we should be worried because it's dirty so this is something called a tube effects worm and i've got a video of this um in uh this is a creek in monroe i can't remember exactly where but it was downstream from a food processing um company and one of the things that food processing companies tend to pollute is organic matter and if you put too much organic matter um, and waste into a water supply that is going to suck out all the oxygen and you're going to have a rapid um, decrease in your oxygen levels because bacteria want to eat up all of that organic matter. So what happens with these tube effects worms is that if you see a lot of these, you know that something isn't quite right because they are going to eat up all of that organic matter. And you can see these little guys. They are uh, using up all the oxygen and 
to decompose all of that organic matter. So if you see a lot of tube effects worms, then probably you know that there's something going on in that water supply that's not quite right. You have a pollution problem. So this is a great table that you'll probably see again on a table or quiz uh, or a quiz or a lab or something. Um, when talking about different types of insects, these are specific microinvertebrates um, that represent um, pollution sensitivity. So if you see mayflies, they are extremely intolerant. What that means is they are only found in very clean, pristine water supplies. Tube effects worms and leeches, they can live in pretty much any type of polluted environment. So we say that they are very tolerant to pollution. So if you see, let's say a lot of these guys, stoneflies, mayflies, um, we know that we could probably be confident in saying that these are good bioindicators that the water is pretty clean. But as you see, um, some of these dragonflies, um, they're becoming more intolerant. And then, you know, the water pollution might be a little worse. But then if you start seeing the pouch snails and the tube effects worms and leeches, then you know you have a water quality pr problem. So this is a really good um, table of bioindicators. So these are just some images of Bearskin Creek, and I want you to take a note of how cloudy they are. Okay, that's going to be important when we talk about um, sediment in a minute as a pollutant. So again, three creeks in Monroe, Richardson's Creek, Stewart's Creek, and Bearskin Creek. These are just some images that I've taken over the years shopping carts in the creek near Monroe Mall. This is used to be where the big lots used to be in Monroe Mall. These were all the big lots shopping carts that people, why, don't have any idea, would just toss them down into the creek from the mall parking lot. So fun stuff. And we do go and clean up this creek every year. Leaves on South Church Street. Again, the leaves being piled up they um, clog the storm drains and then you get a lot of flooding on the streets that is very hazardous. Here are some other types of pollutants that um, you know you could be talking about. Trash, any is considered a water pollutant. Um, fertilizers and nutrients, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Oil and grease, heavy metals, pathogens, and sediment. All right, these are some things that are considered um, pollutants, stormwater pollutants, and can contaminate our water supply. So the number one stormwater pollutant in North Carolina, I don't know if you know this, but it is sediment, okay? North Carolina, especially in Union County, has a lot of this very red clay soil that um, is highly uh, polluting our waters. <laughs> it is where through runoff, construction, cars, um, if you know anything about the bypass that was just built a couple years ago, um, this that was a huge concern for this, um, for the bypass being built and why we didn't build it for about 12 years is because um, the EPA was worried that all of the sediment pollution would kill some of our endangered species that live locally in our creeks. We did end up moving those endangered species other places, and that is why your bypass has been built. So the sediment then runs off, okay, and it does a couple different things. Remember before where you saw all that cloudy water? Well, it clouds the water, okay? The clay becomes suspended in the water. It turns it really ugly and orange, and fish can't live there because they're not getting the nutrients that they need. They're not getting the, um, the plants aren't getting the photosynthesis that they need. 
and the sediment itself is clogging the fish's gills and preventing them from breathing. So sediment does a whole lot of damage um, in our water quality, in our streams and lakes uh, and rivers. It is what our pollutant in China. So these are just some images throughout Monroe that the stormwater people had sent me over the years. Um, these are some things that you'd see common. And whenever you see this kind of stuff, guess what? It all ends up in our creeks and our tributaries, and it all creates us problems for our water quality. All right, anytime you see these big barrels um things leaking dumpsters leaking containers leaking just trash everywhere sediment it's all going into our water supply sometimes we've been cited at cata from our buses because they're washing uh with soap and water and getting all of that stuff out of um off the buses and then it goes right down the storm drain. All right, so you can't be using these uh, chemicals uh, that then return to our tributaries. There's a lot of illicit discharge from different types of um, stores around the area. Sometimes you can have gas and oil leaking. This is an example of uh, an oil leak, okay, because you can see it by that rainbow. And this is important because if you think about how many cars are on the highway and if they are not <coughs> um, running properly and they're leaking oil, those cars add up to a problem in our water supply. So we want to definitely maintain vehicles to prevent the discharge of oil to our local streams. It only takes one drop of oil to contaminate 50 gallons of fresh water. So a little bit of oil goes a long way. Um, and we will talk about uh, some oil spills in the ocean later on in the semester. And of course, our, ha our wildlife is also affected by oil spills. And we all know that there are organizations that then use Dawn to clean the feathers off of our wildlife that gets contaminated with oil spills. So what's this guy? How does this guy affect our water quality? Pathogens, all right. How do pathogens get into our streams and lakes? A couple different reasons, okay? First one is livestock. Here, if this guy's going to be in our lake or our creek, and that's going to run off into Lake Twitty, what's this cow probably doing in the water? He's pooping. All of that poop, all of that waste then gets into our water supply, all right? And it's not a big deal if there's just a couple, maybe even a hundred, but when there's hundreds of thousands of livestock in one area, all right, and you have a lot of poop and all of that poop is going to go into the water and that is going to create a huge health concern. All right, because that is where your pathogens come from. Sewer overflows again, it's sewage. Sewage is organic matter. OK, if it gets into our water supply, it's going to pollute it. I love my dog. I love the dogs. This isn't my dog, but I love him. And I know you guys love your dogs, but please clean up after them. That pet, pet waste, all right, it goes right into our water supply. It carries bacteria, E. coli, all sorts of nasty stuff, and we don't want it in our water supply. Eutrophication. Everybody say it, eutrophication. You will absolutely need to know what eutrophication is and how to say it, all right? Eutrophication is when, for whatever reason, it could come from runoff from farms. It could come off from your, um, your animal waste, but whatever nutrients are loaded up and running off into our water supplies, 
their nutrients, right? There's nitrogen, there's phosphorus, there's all these great things that will create algae to grow. So when you have a lot of these nutrients entering the water, then you have algae blooms. Algae blooms a little bit, okay, but a lot of it will give us that nice green mat on top of the water, which is what we don't want. A couple things happen. First, if you have an algae layer, you don't get any sunlight penetrating the ocean or the lakes or the water, and so it prevents sunlight from reaching the plants, so you can't have any photosynthesis, and so the plants die. And then once the plants start to die, the fish start to die, everything starts to die because you have an unhealthy ecosystem, and then all the decomposers take over and decompose the oxygen to break down organic matter. And as those decomposers are breaking down organic matter, they're sucking out whatever oxygen is left in the ocean or left in that lake or left in that stream. When there is no oxygen left, everything dies and you have absolutely then no ecosystem. And that is a huge problem when we're talking about um, dead zones throughout the world and toxic algae blooms throughout the world um, because it will absolutely kill off the ecosystem and nothing can survive it. So eutrophication is a huge problem um, and you will need to know a lot about that as we continue on. This is an example uh, in the Great Lakes of an, where eutrophication occurs. So all around here are farms and all of these rivers are draining into this area of Lake Erie. And this is a problem for a lot of the Great Lakes is because of all of this farmland and all of this livestock that is located in these areas, all of that runoff is to here. And all of that runoff is bringing all of those nitrogen and phosphates and literally turning the water to look like this. And this is not something you want to drink. This is completely toxic eutrophication algae bloom. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, same thing, where you've got all of this farmland all near the Mississippi River, and it's all flowing down and running off right here to the Gulf of Mexico, creating a hypoxic zone, no oxygen, nothing lives there. Um, and that's the dead zone that you may have heard about in the Gulf of Mexico. Digressing now to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, all right, this is just one of many gyres that are in the ocean that are collecting plastic and microplastics, and it is becoming a problem, and we are trying to limit, obviously, the amount of plastics that are going into our oceans, and we will be talking about more of that later. Um, but you should know a little bit about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and where it is and why you shouldn't litter and why you shouldn't use plastic water bottles and that kind of thing because it all ends up in the Pacific Ocean. And this is just one image of what that looks like up close. Why do we not like this? is because our sea life, our wildlife, our birds are eating the plastic thinking it's food. Because it's plastic, it has no nutrient value and they starve to death. And this is just a dead albatross that albatross that was found with all of those plastics in its stomach. So um, extremely detrimental to our ecosystem because it kills off our wildlife. This is a wonderful picture, in case you're curious, about how long the decomposition rates of common marine debris. Look at this, a diaper, okay? Think of how many diapers are used if they are ending up somewhere in the ocean because of surface runoff or litter or whatever. 450 years to decompose. 
Cigarette butts, one to five years. Aluminum can, 200 years. Please recycle your aluminum. Plastic bottles, 450 years. Again, the plastic be beverage holders are 400 years. Fishing line, 600 years. Plastic grocery bag, 10 to 20 years. So you can see that these are very common items that we all have and use, and this is what happens when they're in the ocean. They do not go away. This is a picture of water pollution in China. This is what people do in these major algae blooms that are highly toxic, and that little child should not be in that water. Indonesia, we've mentioned Indonesia before when talking about El Nino. El Indonesia is down here above Australia. And Indonesia, because it's near the Pacific, it's in the Pacific Ocean, experiences a lot of that um, garbage that's there. And these are just some images of people. <laughs> Their livelihood is to literally collect garbage out of the water to try to then resell it. Okay, um, they are literally mining garbage in the water and this is why we need the EPA because Indonesia does not have an EPA and this is the kind of thing that can happen if we don't have a government that cares about our environment. So common pollutants. Pesticides, we'll talk about later. Pesticides are what we use to keep our pests away. We need them for agriculture. We need them to kill the ants that we have in our yard. But all of those chemicals end up in either our groundwater or our surface runoff. Fertilizers create those algae blooms. Grease, low dissolved oxygen content, sediment, Turbidity is how cloudy or clear the water is, and we're going to look at that as well later with our water pollution lab. If you have a lot of sediment in the water, it increases the turbidity and it um, makes it a lot cloudier than it should be. And if it's cloudy, then you can't have the sun coming through to produce a nice photosynthetic organism. Fecal coliform, that comes from our animal waste. Metals, heavy metals, arsenic, cadmium, lead, these are all highly toxic that we'll be speaking about later. Salt is considered a pollutant because you cannot drink salt water. pH, soap, soap is extremely common because we all want clean cars and we clean our cars in our driveways and all of that soapy water then goes right down the storm, rain, storm drains and of course litter and debris. So everybody litters, everybody discharges things illegally, even the Carolina Panthers, and it's sad and we need to stop because what happens is if you are a big company, if you are a city employee, you will get fined and there are laws out there that we'll be looking at that say, guess what? You're going to get fined because you cannot pollute our surface water and you cannot pollute our drinking water. This was right outside of our city hall. OK, we need to be better at educating people on what can be discharged or not. You cannot just dump out stuff onto the pavement. All of this sediment, OK, this needs to be cleaned up. Drive throughs really bad sometimes, okay? And again, these businesses will get fined, especially if they're leaking their oils out right here into the storm drain. A lot of times you'll have leaky dumpsters with a lot of biologic um, materials. Uh, again, the, the fryer oil, all of these things have to be disposed of properly. If you see this is a Starbucks, they're doing something not great here because look at all this trash and debris. It's going to go straight into the storm drains and, and they have people out here citing all of this um, and giving, uh, giving out violations. Here is Buffalo Wild Wings at 74 at the Monroe Mall. 
So if you have soap suds coming down here, what do you think happened? All right, they're probably, you know, something's going on with their dishwasher or something. They're cleaning outside maybe, but all of those soap suds are going right into our waterways. So you can always report, uh, report spills and discharges. There is a hotline number. There are also other programs that we can do to help with this pollution, which is very important. We can monitor our waterways and we do participate in this world water monitoring challenge. Don't know if we're going to get to do that this year because we can't go on any field trips, which is unfortunate right now, because as we are not going and doing the things that we normally do, which is adding our storm drain markers and adopting a stream, we have Bear Screen Creek that we adopted and we take out tons of trash all the time, twice a year. With not doing that now because of COVID, um, unfortunately, those waterways are just going to become more and more polluted. So hopefully um, we can get back to that soon. Here are all sorts of ways, though, that you can prevent water uh, pollution. Um, use all of those pesticides, fertilizers, and herbicides properly. You're never supposed to put them on the ground right before a heavy rain, okay? Um, please pick up your waste, your waste and trash. Please don't be a litter bug. All right. Um, you can always plant a rain garden. If you have, um, you know, soil in your yard that uh, is kind of impervious, like that clay soil, you can always uh, lay down and plant a little garden to try to soak in more uh, water that way. Don't ever just dump stuff out into the backyard or in a hollow somewhere. You know, I can't imagine anybody just throwing out a TV into a ditch, but I see them all the time and I'm like, who are these people that are doing this? Please don't be one of them. Please make sure you wash your car either at a specific uh, car wash that recycles and collects all of that soapy water or do it in your yard. All right, don't do it on an on, or on your driveway because all that soapy water then just runs off. Compost, we've mentioned compost before. So all of that yard waste, especially right now with all of those leaves, pay attention to when your leaf pickup is or bag your leaves or compost those leaves. You do not want them in the big piles on the side of the road that end up blocking our storm drains. Vegetate bare spots in your yard. This is something really huge. We're going to talk about erosion. The best way to stop soil erosion is to plant trees and grass or some sort of vegetation. All right, please make sure the last thing is if you're painting, clean those brushes in an indoor sink. Don't outside in your yard. Um, paint can be extremely toxic to our wildlife. Um, also make sure that you are, this isn't on here, but recycling your batteries. I do recycle batteries at CADA, so if you want, you can always bring me any type of batteries. We never want to put batteries in um, the trash because they go into a local landfill and batteries contain, contain a whole lot of heavy metals. And so we don't want those heavy metals leaching into our groundwater um, and then getting into our wells. So please make sure that all of your um, electronics and your batteries are disposed of properly. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Have a great day.